nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. So let's continue our discussion of the thermoelectric transport coefficients by talking about the Peltier coefficient. Now, we could do this in the same way that we did the Seebeck coefficient, but actually it turns out that there is a shortcut for the Peltier coefficient, so we'll talk about that. So the Peltier coefficient tells us that if there is a, an electrical current flowing, there is also a heat current flowing at the same time due to that electrical current. And the Peltier coefficient is called pi. This is what we want, we'd like to understand what determines pi. Okay. Well, we could do it mathematically. When we had the electrical current, remember we had the electrons were carrying a charge Q. We could write a Landauer expression for the heat current. But now what's important is the heat energy that they carry. And we'll show in a minute that the heat energy is energy with respect to the Fermi energy. We have to put that inside the integral now because it's energy dependent. And so now we have an expression for the electrical current is the first expression, but the heat current is the second expression. We could go through the mathematics just as we did it for the electrical conductivity and for the Seebeck coefficient, and we could work out the Peltier coefficient. But I don't want to do that. We want to do it in a different way. So let's look physically at what the Peltier effect is all about. So here I have two contacts. I've applied a voltage difference, so I've lowered the Fermi level in the second contact. I've got an average energy at which current flows here. Let's say an n-type semiconductor just above the bottom of the conduction band. And now the question is, what happens here? I know that the current in the contacts, this is a degenerate material, the current flows near the Fermi level. I know that the current in the semiconductor flows a little bit above the bottom of the conduction band. How do electrons get from the Fermi level in the metal to the bottom of the conduction band in the semiconductor? Well, they have to absorb thermal energy to do that. They absorb thermal energy, that cools the first contact down. They transport across the semiconductor. When they exit the sem semiconductor, they give up that energy. Not only do they give up that energy, they give up a little extra energy because the voltage is lower. That extra energy is the power dissipated. The electron now, in the second contact, leaves the contact, at the, flows out at the Fermi energy of the second contact, flows around the external circuit, comes back in, flowing at the Fermi energy, comes into the first contact, and the whole process just keeps repeating itself. So as this electron goes round and round, we pump heat from the cold side, and we dump it in the hot side. And you can easily show, because there's a little extra energy dissipated here because the Fermi level is lower, that the power dissipated is current times voltage, just as we would have expected. All right, let's look a little more closely at what's going on here. So if we look at this first contact, and if I draw the Fermi function in that first contact, what really happens is that electrons that are in the tail of the Fermi distribution, there's a small number up there, they have enough energy just to flow into the semiconductor. But now we've got a hole in the Fermi distribution. It's a highly non-equilibrium distribution. Now we'll have inelastic scattering processes between the electrons and the phonons, and we'll restore thermal equilibrium. That's the process that uh, electrons absorb energy and repopulate that hole in the Fermi in the uh, distribution that was created when they flowed into the semiconductor. So the cooling itself actually takes place in the contact. And you can think of this whole process as like the evaporation of a liquid uh, from, a, uh, from a container into a gas, you know, overcoming an energy barrier. Electrons are evaporating from the contact into the semiconductor. But it's important to note that the thermoelectric cooling takes place not in the semiconductor, but in the metal contact itself. There's a very nice paper by my colleague uh, Ali Shakiri and his students uh, that discuss this in, in detail, and I can recommend that to you. Now let's look a little more closely. We know that contacts aren't ideal. 
uh, there's band bending and shot key barriers and things at contacts. You know, doesn't the Peltier coefficient then depend on the details of the contact and not just on the properties of the semiconductor? Well, no, not if the semiconductor is long. So what happens is something like this. The electrons need to gain thermal energy. If they gain thermal energy, they can surmount the Schottky barrier or tunnel through the tip. Okay, now they've got some significant energy. They tunnel through, but as they propagate in the semiconductor, they're gonna shed that excess energy and relax down the thermal equilibrium in the semiconductor. The net amount that is absorbed is, well, you know, this process, I'll point out, just takes place over an energy relaxation length, which, you know, typical size thermoelectric leg is a small, minuscule fraction of the length of the leg. So once that process has occurred, the net amount of energy that has been absorbed, and the net amount of heat, is just the difference between the energy in the semiconductor and the Fermi energy in the metal. So it is a property of the semiconductor, not a property of the details of what's happening at the metal semiconductor contact. So this is a interesting effect. People oftentimes say that the Peltier effect is a property of the semiconductor, but it requires a junction to see it happen. All right, now let's look at the Peltier coefficient. We actually don't need very much mathematics to derive this. We have an electrical current flowing. I'm talking about an n-type semiconductor here, just to be specific. So there is a flux of electrons that is flowing. The electrons carry their heat with them. So that flux of electrons times the heat, the, the heat that they carry, that they, on average, they absorb a heat that is the average energy at which current flows with respect to the Fermi energy and they carry that heat. So we have an expression for the Peltier coefficient. Uh, you can see that it's going to be negative for an n-type semiconductor because the current is flowing above the Fermi energy. It's gonna be positive for a p-type semiconductor. But it also should remind us, it looks very similar to the expression that we derived for the Seebeck coefficient. In fact, there is a close relation this is a fundamental relation that can be proven thermodynamically. The Peltier coefficient is temperature times the Seebeck coefficient. So in practice, we only have to measure one and then we know the other. There's an intimate connection between these two transport coefficients. All right, so we have now done three of the four transport coefficients. The next transport coefficient to consider is the electronic thermal conductivity which tells us how heat flows in response to a temperature gradient.